Okay, all good. Hi guys, um, welcome to Youth Group. We're gonna kick it off with You Say by Lauren Daigle, so please join us in singing.
Okay, the last one is one and only. <laughs>
Can you grab the lights, please? You didn't want to ruin your I was actually diagnosed with two different anxiety disorders when I first decided to get involved. And I found out that that's not unique. I'm not special in any way. I actually found out around this time that 49.5% of all youth will have an anxiety disorder before they finish their education. And I realized that there is such a need in our world to fight for one another. And I found that through fighting for the unborn. Because as you guys know, or maybe you don't, but an abortion takes the life of a preborn child through different means, oftentimes through suction, through chemicals, but either way, it's the horrific act that takes the life of an unborn child. And when I first found this out, I was completely heartbroken. And I sort of found out that there is no one in this world that is exempt from suffering, right? So I knew in that moment that it was absolutely necessary to fight for one another, no matter what age, stage, or location you are in life. So my life was changed by a saying that said, where there's life, there's hope. And I began to fight for the unborn. I used to believe, though, that you had to be a certain age to get involved, and that is so far from the truth. You can be a young pro-life activist, and I've been doing this for two years. And the truth is, we need every voice in this movement, no matter what age you are. You guys can make a difference no matter what, and that's what I want to talk to you guys about. How the youth in our country are so vital to this battle, and how we need you guys to stand up just as much as anyone else. And so if I can make a difference at 19, so can you. And so we're going to talk about how you can do that, and a little bit more about who I am and some ways to get involved in our own community and our small community here in Motley, Minnesota, or wherever you guys are coming from. I'm from the Staples Motley area. I began my journey through activism at the Lakes Area Pregnancy Support Center. Lisa's actually sitting right there. So Lisa, if you raise your hand. She is the director of the Lakes Area Pregnancy Support Center, Staples Branch. And she also, as well as myself, saw a need in every community, in every city across the world, to speak the truth about the dignity of human life whether it's small town Staples or New York City. There's a need everywhere, because there's people everywhere that need us to love them. I would start baby clothes, I would sit in a little room, and I would get baby clothes ready to go out into the community, and I would just dream about a world where life was dignified, celebrated, and protected. Since meeting Lisa, I've had so many opportunities to fight for life, from, from conception all the way to natural death. I have served as the North Dakota State Captain for Students for Life Action, and now I'm in one of Students for Life's longest running fellowships. It's called the Wilberforce Fellowship. I've also been given the opportunity to be club president at North Dakota State University, where I study psychology, neuroscience, and strategic communication. I also get to be in charge of pro-life ministries on campus. Another thing I got to do because of doing this work is I got to be at the United States Supreme Court the moment that Roe v. Wade was overturned. It was on June 24, 2022. You guys may have saw it on the news, or maybe your families talked about it. But they decided to overturn a decision called Roe v. Wade, which said that any the life of a preborn child was a federal right. They upheld this in 50 states for almost 50 years, often a time of birth. 
This decision has led to the death of almost 60, not almost, more than 60 million children. But the effects on our society have been much greater. We've been living in a world that forgets just how worth fighting for each and every person is. And that's why I started fighting for life. At 17, I saw that abortion was destroying the way that we see ourselves, the people we love, our relationships. Abortion says that we don't need to value one another. It was a Supreme Court case called Dobbs versus Jackson that said that Roe could be overturned because they talked about the viability argument. They said that babies at 15 weeks old were worth saving, and we, we agree, or at least I hope we agree, that as Christians, babies at every stage are worth protecting. So this decision challenged the idea that viability is a subjective line, because as science and technology have improved, we know that babies in the womb are preborn. They're preborn, but they're human lives. So we now see that they're surviving younger and younger. And as I said, that each stage and location that you're in does not determine your worth as a human being. You're worth it simply because you're human. So babies at 15 weeks are worth protecting, and the Supreme Court agrees, then Roe has no standing. So I got to be there the moment that decision was made, which was absolutely historic. We saw a new hope. The battle has returned to the states, and we know that when we fight, we see results. And I always said, if you were born after 1973, the only thing that you have ever known is abortion as a national right. We are now in a new pro-life movement, right? But one heartbreaking statistic still stands. If you were born after 1973, I think pretty much everyone in the room was, then up to one fourth of your generation is missing but you guys are the future of the pro-life movement. You don't have to reach a certain point to be adequate as an activist or to stand up for their rights. You are qualified to fight for life simply because you are alive. As Christians, we have an obligation to stand up for those who can't stand for themselves. The truth is it's a miracle that you're here, no matter what your struggles are today. God chose you specifically to be here. He has a plan for your life, your struggles, all of it. You were given a chance at life, but so many preborn children were not given the same chance. They are seen as a choice, a decision to be made. But you have always been more than just a choice. Friends, it doesn't matter how old you are. In fact, we need you, the youth of our country, to be unapologetic fighters for the dignity of all life. You are going to be the ones who influence the next generation. But I know what you're thinking right now, that this seems impossible. How can we make a difference in Motley, Minnesota? And that's what I thought too. But I found out that there are so many ways to get involved. One of them is simply getting involved in your state. Minnesota still protects abortion through almost 24 weeks. And it's underregulated, and girls as young as 13 or 14 are being targeted by this multi-million dollar industry. And we know that there are so many women who need our help, right? And that's, you guys are a similar age in this room, and we don't know who needs this type of help. We don't know whose story is being affected, and we just know that we need to love one another. So, so Minnesota has one of the longest running pro-life organizations in our state, the Minnesota Citizens Concerned for Life. They've been around before Roe, and they will continue to fight post-Roe. Even when laws reflect pro-life values, we still need to be there to remind women that they are strong enough. You can also get involved with our local pregnancy resource center, as I said, the Lakes Area Pregnancy Support Center, who are offering life-affirming resources and help for women in crisis pregnancies. Each conversation, post on social media, action makes a difference. Some other things that you guys can do right now is to continue to love one another, to inspire people by the way you love, to uphold the dignity of each human person by loving them in word and in deed. Remind every person you meet that they are worth fighting for. And live as though your life is a miracle, because it is. Being pro-life is more than fighting for the unborn. It's a lifestyle. It's choosing love and remembering your worth as a child of God. <coughs> be joyful. Be unapologetically who you are. You were created to defend the good. You have been given unique gifts that you are meant to use. Lean into your passions that God gave you. He gave you those for a reason. Esther 414 says, perhaps you were created for such a time as this. And of course, pray. 
prayer works. We prayed for 49 years to see the decision of Roe to be overturned, and 49 years later we saw it, but we need to be prayer warriors in every stage of this fight. And your role is so important. Currently, young people who are your exact age are experiencing higher rates of anxiety and depression than ever before. We are devaluing human life, so it makes sense that when we don't see worth in a child, we don't see it in ourselves. But you are worth fighting for. You, as the youth of our nation, are in an especially interesting battle. We are seeing the culture of death being promoted on social media, on our schools. You're seeing a lot of noise that says that you guys need to be pro-choice. You're seeing a lot of noise that you need to be for these things. And that is simply, simply not true. Just because you're young doesn't mean you have to follow what the culture says. But you don't have to believe the lie that your life didn't matter until you hit a certain stage of development. If we're teaching generations that their life didn't matter at one point, then it makes sense that we would see the same mindset in ourselves. But we have an opportunity to change this and be the reason someone believes in the dignity of life. If you don't know where to start, love the people that are here. Every single person you have gotten to know and love was once an unborn child. We see worth in every single human being, and that includes the unborn. You weren't born with worth, you were created with it. And the truth is, our society is allowing the lives of unborn children to be taken every single day, even after Roe v. Wade. But when culture sees a life that is disposable, we see a baby who is rapidly growing, and by day 21 already has a beating heart. Babies in the womb up until 40 weeks are rapidly developing, and they are they have fingerprints, they have unique DNA, they will never be repeated, just as every single one of you in this room are a unique human being who will never be repeated, who will never be here again. And we are so thankful that you guys are alive here today. The reason I'm speaking to you is because young girls, as I've said, sometimes as young as 13, are being sold pills or being told that abortion is not a big deal. But you can make a difference no matter what age you are by being a light that reflects Jesus' heart in your community. The pro-life movement is made up of small actions that add up a huge difference. Choosing to pray for someone you love, telling someone that they matter, and being confident in your identity, which is never changing and eternal. That no matter what age, stage, or location you are, your life matters, and that's why we're pro-life. We are meant to share the gospel. The gospel that he chooses what kind of people matter, that he says every single person matters, that he gives life, that these children matter deeply to Jesus and they are not forgotten, just as you are never forgotten. We must use our community to share what we know is true. Each and every one of you are alike by being exactly who you are. Use your gifts in your schools, churches, and in your community. Because as a youth, we will be the next generation. But you are never too young to start using your voice. I know I said that a lot, but I just want to stress that point. Because I was, I was 17, but I could have started earlier if I didn't feel held back by my fears of being vocal. But honestly, you guys, the truth is that life matters at every stage. And so do you guys. And that's, that's why we fight for all human beings. Because people are worth saving. We were created for more than the pain that choosing death over life has to offer. But we can't do it alone. We need each other. That's why we promise to stand alongside women who are facing an unplanned pregnancy. And we are walking alongside you in your suffering because Jesus makes everything beautiful in its time, even the situations that seem to have the least amount of hope. You see, the cross is a reminder that you are worthy and loved. We have resources for you, no matter what you're facing, we promise that you will never have to face it alone. So visit lakesareapregnancy.org if you need immediate and compassionate support. Studentsforlife.org can help you get involved as a student. That's where I started. If you need mental health support, don't be afraid to ask for help or find me afterwards if you need resources. It's more than just abortion, but abortion says that we have to face difficult circumstances by ourselves. That is so far from the truth. We are standing with each other. And so I just want you guys to know, more than anything else, if 
And I know this is kind of a little bit of a short speech, but if you guys don't take away anything else, just remember that your life has always mattered and there are people every day that are fighting for you, whether you realize it or not, and you have the power to choose life because Jesus brings hope into every impossible situation. He makes everything beautiful in its time. And I'm so thankful that you guys are here. Thank you for listening to my little spiel. I do have some flyers for you guys, if you guys forgot any of the resources I mentioned. Um, I have sort of an online blog situation, and I want you guys to know that I'm from, I'm from Staples. If you need resources, reach out to me anytime. My email is on here, and you guys are you guys are loved so much more than you will ever know by the God that created you. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, Yeah, we got it. Hey, they're awesome. What are your Tatum. Tatum. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Come in. Oh, thank you for having me. This is short. Long time. Long time. Questions that you want to ask Chloe before she's done? Did you put a pillager? I did. Okay, I remember you. I was definitely younger than you, but for some reason I remember you. I think I remember you too. Yeah. Can you put a pillager? Yep, I remember you. 100%. Yeah, I was like, I'm pretty sure Jess, she went to my Do you have a Bible? Do you have a Bible? Do you have a Bible? Okay, so. You keep passing those around, and then if you don't have a Bible, grab one here off the cart. We are going to look at John for a minute yet. together. We thank you so much for your word, Lord. We thank you um, for what you are going to speak to these kids. We thank you for Chloe being here tonight and the voice that she has for you, Lord, to uphold life. Father, I pray that you just continue to speak to these young people. You have given them all a gift. You have placed talents upon each and every one of them here tonight, Lord, that you will raise them up to be the men and women of God that you have made them to be. And I thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you again for your word and what you'll speak to us now in the book of John. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, um, I wanted to read just a slight bit of commentary before we start. In John, John is talking, John is the disciple John, okay? So we're in the Gospel of John. So you've got your Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You're in your New Testament. You should turn in there. So we're looking at 
the book of John tonight, just chapter one, but chapter one is plenty long, so getting it read will probably be about as far as we get tonight. Um, but this is John the disciple who is going to be speaking a lot in chapter one about John the Baptist, okay, cousin? Yes, a little confusing, so I wanted to try to clear that up before we started. John is also, this John that's doing the writing is also the brother of James. They call them the sons of thunder. They are the sons of Zebedee. So I thought this commentator does a great job of writing. It sounds like he's got the great start of a movie here. It says, he spoke and the galaxies whirled into place. So he's speaking about God Almighty and Jesus in the beginning. The stars burned and the heavens and the planets began orbiting their suns. Words of awesome, unlimited, unleashed power. He spoke again, and the waters and the lands were filled with plants and creatures running, swimming, growing, and multiplying. Words of animating, breathing, pulsing life. Again he spoke, and man and woman were formed. Thinking, speaking, and loving. Words of personal and creative glory. Eternal, infinite, and unlimited. He was... He is, and he always will be the maker and Lord of all that exists. And then he came in the flesh to a speck in the universe called the planet Earth. The mighty creator became a part of the creation, limited by time and space and susceptible to aging, sickness, and death. But love propelled him on, and so he came to rescue and save those who were lost and to give them the gift of eternity. He is the word here in John 1.1. He is Jesus, the Christ. It is the truth that the Apostle John brings us in this book, John's Gospel, is not a life of Christ. It is a powerful argument for the Incarnation, a conclusive demonstration that Jesus was, he is, the very heaven-sent Son of God and the only source of eternal life. John discloses Christ's identity with his very first words, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So that's where we're going to start in John 1.1. 1, 1. Are we all ready for it? So as usual, in case time allows, because it shouldn't take me that long to read it, um, pick out what you have questions about. Pick out, yeah, I know, I know, I know who's going to have the floor tonight. Um, but things, that's right, we will miss you. Um, so pick out the things that you like, things that stand out to you, things that you have questions about. But here we go, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear a witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. The world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received the grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Christ Jesus. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Verse 19. Now this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he said, No. Then they said to him, Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? This is John saying, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah had said, 
Verse 24. Now those who were sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. But there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethphara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Again the next day John stood with the two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them follow, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and they saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. Verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated to Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of the Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said to him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Okay, that is chapter 1, all 50 verses of it, 51 verses. Oh, I gotta get a drink. What, do you, what did you take from that tonight? Okay, cool, I have three things. Mm -hmm. I'll let you start. Okay. okay, so the first one is verse 5, when it talks about the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Yeah. It just like, oh, Tatum, do you want to? No, you can, you're going to say exactly what I'm going to say. Oh, I was just going to say, like, how God is light, and, like, no matter how little light you have, like, um, the amount of, like, little faith in people, there's still, like, light will always overcome darkness. Like, if you have a pitch black room and then you put a candle in it, like, this light will still shine. The darkness will never overcome it. And so, like, that's just a good reminder that, like, Satan will never overcome God. Amen. And, well, do you want every other? No, you can keep going. Okay. <laughs> but, and then the next thing is when he calls, like, the disciples... I think it's like good to remember that Jesus didn't like he very well could have just like went up to all the like the political leaders and stuff like the actual people that make a difference in the world sure. but he went up to people who believed in him and like he met he let them come to him mm -hmm. and be like oh you are the messiah so like he God takes random people like you don't have to be in this important like position or role to follow Jesus you can literally be anyone like it doesn't need to be I don't know the and then, ordinary yeah yeah and then in verse 47 when um, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of, said of him behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit it just like at camp this year Dan mentioned a verse talking about how like 
there was like a prophecy in Isaiah about talking mm -hmm. about how there's like a guy that will come with no deceit in him or like and that's just that reminds me of it, but I can't remember mm -hmm. what the yeah. verse was. If you're right, we are all going to be impressed with you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed with you. Yeah. 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 Uh, we gotta wait to find out if he's right. That's what I'm pretty sure it is. You are a great listener. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so close. Is it, is it no, close? I don't know. Yeah. And I remember there was a three in it. What? it you guys are doing three. great. You are? Is that all your points? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alright. Okay, go I ahead. Have a few it was as well. 50. Wait. <laughs> Yes, it was it was fifty three nine, 50 not forty three. No, or now I'm intrigued, AJ. I'm still impressed. Oh, yeah, that is impressive. Okay, wait. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his step, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. And they're talking about Jesus. Wow. Wow. We to take team that one, guys. Good job. All right. Good listening. So what I was going to say is the first verse, I think, is just really bold right away. Like, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Like, I feel like it's such a controversial thing, especially the Trinity, even though it shouldn't be. But so many people get, like, I don't know, angry and argue about it. And, like, the timeline of things, when realistically the timeline is forever from the beginning. Like, it's always been. Rather than, like, people are like, well, was it this exact time? It's like, well, no, because he said that from the beginning. And, like, it says he was in the beginning with God. And I think that's really interesting how, like, before people were even talking about Jesus or even met Jesus, like, he was already there. Yeah. And it's just, it goes beyond just, like, the thing where they show, like, the predictions of Jesus. going to Like, you know, like, how they talk about it ahead of time. Like, it just goes beyond that. So um, before you move on, okay. I want to, to make that point very clear. So when she's talking about in the beginning was the word, that wor word word is referring to Jesus. So in the beginning was Jesus, okay? And Jesus was with God. It's a huge point because there are many adults, when dad does his Bible studies around here, there are many times that adult people have no idea that Jesus was in the beginning, in creation creating with God, okay? They don't know, so when you don't read your word to know what it says about it, that's why we tell you every week, get into your Bible, read it so you know. But there are so many people that have looked at him, and which pastor, have said, I didn't know that. I didn't know that Jesus, I thought Jesus came when he was born. And there are many people that don't realize that he was in the beginning with God. And so I want that to be very clear to you tonight. That he was in the beginning. The Trinity was all together in the beginning. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, good point. Go ahead. Um, and then in verse 17 it says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That just like sums up like the religion versus relationship. Like, but how like they're both like important. Mm -hmm. But like it talks about like while the law was given through that, grace and truth, which is what like we actually are like saved through, yep. is from Jesus Christ, not just from like ourselves and following the law. And I think that that's just like they make it like such a small point, but it's such a big part, and it really sums up a ton of what Christianity is, yeah. all in one verse. And I feel like that's not one that people bring up much to talk about that, but that's something I realize is really similar to that like conversation, like Craig talked about. Was that last week? Yeah, relationship versus religion. Mm -hmm. um, and then verse 20, this one's kind of just random, but it said he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. I think that's so interesting because they are like so quick to be like, you are Christ, like you are like yeah. Elijah. And he could have just been like, yeah, you know what I am. Or he might not have wanted to say I'm Christ, but he could have said I'm Elijah. And people would have been like, oh, okay. And then they probably would have worshipped him at that point. He could have had that credit. He could have been put into higher standing, because I don't know how high a standing he was in. It sounds like people were upset with him for baptizing yeah, other people. Yeah, he had made himself in a lowly state. When you think yeah. of him and his appearance of being in his camel hair outfit and him being in the wilderness alone up to the point of him coming forth to declare the way, yeah. um, he had taken a very humble state. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, he could have had this chance to, like, be treated as royalty. 
completely because they were like begging him to be that person and he like confessed like no that's not me and to have like a love for christ at that time is a little different from now because we've had like we know that christ came yeah but i mean i'm sure that there are still people who claim to be christ or things like that now but at that time like he totally people would have believed him and hung on every word he said but he instead stood up for who christ actually is even though people didn't like to hear that yeah so i thought that was really interesting i think i have another one but i'm not sure which goes against um, like our human nature as people, right? Our human nature is we want, we want to be winners. We want to be the best. We want to be liked. You know, we want to be popular. We want to have friends. So it go, really goes against to continue to take a humble approach. Yeah, especially when the opportunity is there. Right. Like it's not like he had to go out of his way. He more so had to go out of his way to deny being yeah. Jesus or Elijah, I guess, did they ask. Um, the last thing I was going to say, I guess for now, unless something else comes up, um, verse, verses 50 and 51, so it just says, Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, most assuredly I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open, the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Like, it's just interesting to me, like, how he only just saw him, like, from a distance, which anyone can do, and he yeah. was just, like, astonished, and he's like, you have no idea like what's coming and like the wonders he's done or like going to do what they've already seen like or what they've heard about like in Moses' time like that stuff's crazier to me than just seeing someone under a tree yeah so it's just interesting to me how quick people forget about those big things but then we'll take the small things and because they want to believe that or something they'll take it really instantly mm -hmm. so i just found that super interesting like how that was what got him to think oh okay so you must be jesus because you saw me yeah. Like, it's a little thing. Yeah, under a tree. That was my last one. <laughs> All right. Anybody else have things you that stood out to you? One thing I always kind of get a kick out of is nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Yeah. Out of, out of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. You know? I always got a kick out of that. that nothing good ever comes out of Nazareth. Yeah. Imagine if they would have placed money on that, Craig. <laughs> so, um, Peter meaning the rock, it says Cephas in one line and Peter in a, another line down. I thought, um, just wanted to point that out to you too, that's around 42 and 43. What did they call like Yeah. Stone. Well, um, the reference to the rock on which... You know, Peter was going to be the rock on which he was going to build his church. So you know the verse about the rock, build your house on the firm foundation of the rock. Yep. Right? So you know the little stand song about the rain came down. You want, you want your solid foundation. Yep. And Peter was who he had planned would build his church. Um, okay. Anybody else? have anything you want to add to what the girls were saying? <laughs> if Connor was here, he'd say that. I agree. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Connor yeah. would yeah. say. Wait, wait. Yes, there you go. That's... I concur. Okay, let me pull out here. Yes. Yeah. You like verse 18. Okay. What the son who himself is God in, in, in close relationship. Yes. It's like pretty much talking about the Trinity. Yep. He's declaring him. So, just as a couple of brief notes, I uh, wrote down. Um, John's book beckons us to know and love the awesomeness of who Jesus really is. God in flesh. So, born as a human being, right? He came. He was in the splendor of heaven with God Almighty. And willing to leave all of that to come to lonely earth. Now, this is all we know, right? As human beings, it's all we know. So, some of us look at what we have around us, so we think we've got a home and the green, especially in summertime in Minnesota, it's beautiful, right? Beautiful. But we know no, nothing else. 
We don't know the splendor of being in the presence of God Almighty, the creator of the universe. He did. And he willingly came because of his love for you. So I think it's fantastic how, um, with Chloe's talking today, how that ties together. Right? Of life. Jesus came himself as an infant, born in human flesh. Each of us also, God has planned and created because he has that perfect plan and purpose for you to fulfill while you're here. John had, John the Baptist had that, John the disciple had that. They all had the perfect plan that God had before time. He knew you, it said, before he created you in your mother's womb. We read that in um, Psalm 139. And so, this book talks about who Jesus really is, God of flesh. He is love. He is hope. Chloe pointed that out. He is eternal. He is security. He is the word. Yet, he is also all-powerful, the living God. Um, he is our savior, and he's our redeemer and friend. If we but choose him. We all have the opportunity to choose, but we also have the opportunity to choose to deny him. And as you're growing into these young men and women, it is all your own choice. Do I choose to follow the living God? Do I choose to believe he is who he says he is? Or do I choose to not believe or go off and do what I see is popular anywhere else. You have that choice. God loves you that much that he's allowing you that choice. He doesn't want the robots. He wants you to choose to chase after him, to choose that love relationship. Um, I wrote a little verse down there. I'm not sure if I need that yet or not. So verse 12 and 13, I'm going to reread. I don't think you hit those. So I'm going to, um, point those out um so 12 and 13 says but as many as received him that's jesus to him to them he gave the right to become the children of god so that's just tying off of what we were just talking about you have the right to choose him right and when you choose him he gives you the right to become children of god to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood nor of the will of flesh so originally we are born as that infant child and as the good book tells us we are born with that sin nature just naturally inborn sin within us and so at some point in our walk of life we have to choose jesus and then when we choose jesus we are no longer just born of the blood and the will of the flesh nor the will of man, it says, but now we are born of God. When we make that choice to follow Jesus Christ, we now become born of God. And I think that is important. That is the most important decision you'll ever make, in my personal opinion, is to choose Jesus and then be born past just being having your physical birth, but now you are born of God as a follower of Jesus Christ. Um, one point that I made for myself while reading over this and studying it, um, when it says we were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh, that is so hard because that is so within us. I don't know about you as individuals, but in your walk with Jesus, I assume I'm not the only one that struggles with the fleshly fight on a daily basis, right? There are things that come into our life to distract us on a daily basis, to pull us in a daily basis. And that is where we tell you all the time, you've got to constantly be in your word daily. You need to be in daily prayer and communication with God so he can help us to stay close to him. He can help us stay on the right course because when we take our eyes off of him, how easy it is to stray. And so it is our job then to get in here to keep our eyes focused. Because my will, that will of the flesh, wants to tend to go. 
I want to, I want to stray. I want to follow something else. I want to get distracted because those seem like fun things. They seem like they might be entertaining, but it's maybe not the best path that God has for me. So we must keep our eyes fixed on his will rather than our own. And I just asked, Lord, how, how do I get to that place? where I want nothing but the will of God for my life, right? As followers of Jesus Christ, how do we get ourselves to that place that I want nothing else but God's will for my life? That's hard. I don't know about you. I've been a follower of Jesus a long time now. You know, I just hit 42, and I asked the Lord in my heart at four, so that's a whole 38 years of following Jesus, and I still have the daily battle, right? Which is a whole lot older than all of you. So, not all. <laughs> Minus a couple. <laughs> Minus a couple of you, maybe. <laughs> but we still have that pull. So, to match our will to the Lord's. All right, let me see what else I got here. I just also put a note. Can we stand up for our faith when we're being tested by the world around us? So, one of the reasons why I felt led to go to John is because if you know Pastor Jim very well, you know that he directs any new believers and anybody wondering where to start in their Bible to start with the book of John. Because John is conclusively pointing to the fact that Jesus was more than just a mere man, more than just a good man that came and walked among us, which is what some people teach but that he is God in the flesh. So um, we also had like a CE meeting around here fairly recently. And so we were talking as children's leaders and children's programming leaders in this body. How do we continue to encourage you as the next generation of leaders to know how to stand up for your faith, right? You are all, some of you have hit the adulthood right? And some of you are getting close and some of you will take a few years, but you're getting, going to get there in the next few years to be adults and to be the next leaders for Jesus Christ. You have to know how to stand on that faith. As you go out into the world, can you stand on that? Just like Craig was talking to you about, that's where you have to know, can I stand on this? Do I just have some religious standards I'm trying to keep because I see this happening or I grew up in this family and they do all these things, so I gotta do these things. Or do you have that personal walk with Jesus Christ? You know he is your savior, you know he is your best friend. You know that I'm standing on this regardless because of what he says and what he does and that has changed my life. There is a difference. So you need to get yourself to that place. Can I stand on the word of God? Because I know what it says. And so I'm hopeful that as we go through John here now in the next, it's going to be a long time. It could be all school year when you've got me teaching. Um, because it's, it's quite a few chapters. Normally I pick little chapters when we're going through books of the Bible. But um, since I feel like this is where we are to go, this is basics. But I'm hoping that it gives you that foundation that as we go through this, that you will be able to say, I can stand, I understand that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, which is also found in John. And so that you can stand up for that, no matter where you are, no matter who you're talking to. So I'm hoping that we will get into good discussion with some of the difficult points that people will come at you with. Well, what about this? What about this? Um, there's a, a big word which is called apologetics out there um, that I don't know if you know, as young people know much about or not. I did not until probably the last 10 years, honestly. Um, and that's being able to stand up for your faith to people around you. And um, the experts, experts being whoever they are, um, say it's much tougher for your generations to be able to stand up. Um, and so we as your leaders, we as your parents, need to do a better job of training you in the apologetics of the way to be able to stand up for your faith, for you to be able to stand up against the tough questions of, well, was creation really seven days, or because the Bible says to God, 
a year can be like a thousand, you know, to God. Um, do you know the answers to that? Can you stand up and can you back up what the word is in Genesis that says a day was a literal day? Do you know that fact? And, or do you not? And so all of a sudden we start to shrink back and be like, I don't know, maybe it was. If the Bible says a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, maybe that's, it was a thousand years it took for creation. That's not truth, and it starts to deteriorate your belief in the Bible. And so you have to know and have the foundation. And so my hope is that as we go through this, some of those things we can discuss um, as we're discussing the basics of John, that you will have the answers to some of those tough questions too, so you will be prepared to stand up for your walk with the Lord. Let's um, take some prayer requests because we're running out of time here. Jess, can I say one more thing? Yes, please do. Um, the way you're talking about like things of our generation, it's harder for us to stand up. I think that it's very interesting that we're supposed to be the generation of like having an open mind, but then we have a mind that's geared towards Christ, or like not that mind though. Like, yeah. they're very specific about having an open mind and, like, experiencing things, but then as soon as you are dead set on, like, I am a Christian, then the world is, like, they shun you for it. And it's, like, how does that match with that, though, of having an open mind and everything you choose is right? Like, it's just very, like, contradictive, I guess. It is contradictory. It's part of our cancel culture. Yeah. That's a huge part of it. Yeah. yeah. That's like I said last week, you have to know what you believe because especially you guys going off to college and stuff right now, you're going to get bombarded with everything. I already do in like public schools too. Yep. Though. And it will happen even when you go to Christian college settings. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you, I have had youth after youth go into Christian colleges and come back and say, well, they taught us that the seven days wasn't a literal seven days That's at a Christian college. Worse. And it breaks my heart. But there is an undermining in Christian colleges, too. Um, and so you have, to, you have to be aware of that. And it's hard as young people. I feel I'm, I'm a pretty naive girl about things. And so I want to take what people tell me as fact and truth. Um, is that, did you say that's why I'm married, too? <laughs> that's probably true. Um, Just kidding, too. But... I do. I mean, I would buy a hook, line, and sinker, whatever any adult told me, because they were adults, they were an authority, and they knew. They were. They knew, right? If they were my teachers, they knew better than I did. So what they had to have been telling me was true. The only thing I ever questioned was evolution, because my mom, as a kid, told me that was bunk. But so that's the only thing I ever questioned. So becoming an adult and getting into the Word of God has made me see that you, you do need to question things. If you don't know what's in here, you can't stand up for it. It's easy to be swayed and just go along with what everybody else is doing and saying. Okay, back to our prayer request. I don't think we get that off track. No. Yes? What do we say of the wedding and my speech? Because I told you you're not going to bring it down yet. Okay. I remind him for months. I'm not even going to feel that. <laughs> yeah, it could wing be it. the best. It's, it's, it's only Saturday. We still got time. Just wing it. Just wing it. Just wing it. Just wing it. Yeah. He took work out this week. So I did fine. Excellent. There's, movie, there's movies out there that have really good ones. You can oh, you're not happy in a movie speech. <laughs> Okay, yes, we hope for a entertainment and size win. Last week, and then the brother-in-law, wow, you guys are really stepping up to the plate. You asked about praying for the wedding last week. I did. Um, yes. Do you want to do a speech? We plan the wedding at your I'll wait a speech. Which one? Sierra. Okay. And then my mom's surgery at the uh, beginning of September. Okay. 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 
Oh, no, that's just Other requests? Yeah, like Connor from Seattle. What's his name? Huh? Grandpa. What, grandpa's name? Grandpa. She's like, you're a little late, Owen. It's just Richard. Grandpa Richard, okay. <laughs> My grandpa Richard had COVID last week. <laughs> that would be very weird. Okay. Anything else? All right, let's spend some time in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank and praise you so much, Lord, for the opportunity to come together again tonight. Father, I thank you for these young people. I thank you for their heart to be here in your house and to hear from you, Father. I pray that you just have spoke to them tonight. Thank you for Chloe and her ministry, Lord Jesus. We pray that you continue to bless and use her, Father God. We thank you for her willingness to share with our young people. Father, I pray that something within that spoke to them, to their hearts. I pray, Father God, that your word continues to speak to these friends. I pray that they find time daily to get into your word, whether it's starting with a verse or chapters, Lord Jesus. I pray that you will speak to them. I pray that you will continue to grow them, to mold them into the men and women that you have created them to be. Father, I pray for these requests tonight. We thank you for our family members, Lord, but there are family members tonight, Father, that are hurting, that have surgeries coming up, and we just ask you, Lord, please intervene on their behalf. We pray um, for Olivia's aunt and uncle. We pray that you will just watch over and protect them, guide and direct them, we pray. We pray for April's surgery coming, Lord Jesus, that you will guide and direct the doctor's hands, that you will help April to heal quickly, Lord. We pray for Cy and Tatum on Saturday, Friday night, Saturday, Lord Jesus, as the wedding is going to be here. We thank you for such joyous occasions, Lord Jesus. We pray that you just bless them with a beautiful day. We pray, Father, that things will go smoothly. We pray for Boyd, Lord Jesus, that you will give him a boldness that he's never known. Father, we thank you for how you just work on our behalf. We thank you for Grandpa Richard and that you'll place your healing hand upon his body as well. I thank you for each and every one that took time tonight to be here. Lord, I pray that you just continue to bless, use them, and guide and direct them and keep them safe on their way home. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, friends, for coming tonight. Wave to Oli, everybody. She wants oh, to wave yes. Oh, yeah. Hello, Olivia. We're waving. Bye, Olivia. Bye, Olivia. Bye, Olivia. Bye, Olivia. Bye, Olivia. Bye, and I thought I saw Brooke on there. Hello, Brooke. Um, good night, friends. If you have Bibles, please put them away. Do you want to wave to Olivia? What? At the wedding? Do you yeah. want to wave? Hi. I don't think we're going to do an old wedding. You're the settler. She's the preacher. Do you want to wave to Olivia? Yeah, wave to her. I can do it. Keep real close. I was on that. Do you want to wave to Olivia? Olivia? I'll wave to Olivia. Brooks. And everybody else. Thank you guys so much for coming. I'm a little here, but. Uh, yeah. Bye. 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 Bye